Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In today's parable, which we heard read moments ago, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a king. He arranges a wedding feast for his son, and then when the time comes to celebrate this wedding, the king sends out his servants to call those whom he had previously invited, but they are not willing to come. The king had genuinely wanted these people to arrive at the wedding, to celebrate the wedding of his son, to enjoy the benefits of his feast that he had prepared. And so he sent out more servants to these people. And he instructed these servants, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But those who were invited still would have nothing to do with the feast. They made light of it, Jesus says. And they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his business. They thought little of the invitation. They despised the king. And they thought that the things of daily life, the farm, the business, the work, that these things were more important than the feast. The rest, however, Jesus says, seized the king's servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. Some think little of the invitation to the wedding. Some think little of the wedding itself. Others, however, are filled with such vitriol towards the king that they seize his servants, they treat them spitefully, and they murder them. They shoot the messenger. When the king hears of all this, he's furious, of course. And so he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. The king, who had earnestly desired that all of these people come to the wedding, that all of these people of his, that they receive the benefits of the wedding, that they enjoy it, now, because of their rejecting it, because of them judging themselves unworthy of the kingdom, they were given the reward of rebellion. But the king is still chiefly known by showing mercy. And he wants people to enjoy this wedding feast that he has prepared. So he tells his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. The king tells his servants, go out into the highways, go out into all the world, find whoever you can, and bring them into this feast. The servants went. They did this. They gathered together all they found, both the good and the bad, those who live upright, upstanding lives before the world and those who are, frankly, bad people. They bring them in, the good and the bad alike. And there, they enjoy the blessings of the wedding. The king then enters the wedding hall to see his guests enjoying the feast and what should he see but a man not wearing the wedding garment? Now, the wedding garment was provided by the king. And so, the fact that this man is not wearing a wedding garment is a sign of rebelliousness and disobedience. It's as if the invitation had said, black tie required, and by the way, I will give you the black tie when you get here. This man, though, however, refused to wear the black tie. He refused to wear the wedding garment. And so the king approaches him and asks him why he is improperly attired. And the man is speechless. So then he receives a similar judgment to those who rejected the invitation initially. He's bound hand and foot, thrown out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus then tells us the point of this parable. In the last verse of today's gospel lesson, he says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called to the wedding feast. Few partake in it. With these words, Jesus is telling us that he is teaching us the article of faith that we call predestination, or eternal election. This parable is Jesus teaching us how we are to view eternal election, how we are to understand predestination. Now, typically, 
when people start thinking anything about predestination, you know where things go. They automatically start from what they think is God's point of view. God from eternity chose some to be saved eternally. Okay. But beginning of there, human reason takes over and leads to all kinds of questions that Scripture doesn't ask or answer. And it leads to all sorts of assertions that Scripture doesn't make. And so human reason, peering into what God has not revealed, imagines, well, if God has predestined some to salvation, he therefore must have predestined everyone else to damnation and eternal wrath. But the scripture doesn't say this. Human reason says, well, if God has predestined some to salvation, but God is not the author of evil, then he must simply have passed over them, leaving them to the eternal punishment that they deserved. And others will reason that there must be a cause within themselves, so that they may be perhaps the elect, the chosen, would use free will to choose to believe, while those who are not elect, the reprobate, would use their free will to reject faith in Christ. But neither of these is true and scriptural, for scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one who creates faith in our hearts through the hearing of his word. So that our initial belief in the gospel is not an exercise of any spiritual free will on our part. Because St. Paul and Christ says we have no free will apart from him. Before the Holy Spirit recreates us. And even when we say that God elected those whom he foresaw would believe. It still doesn't answer the question. Because faith is still the gift of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't penetrate the darkness that surrounds and shrouds that which God has not revealed to us in Scripture. And when we approach predestination like that, looking at the, starting at the point of God's hidden will and with human reason, predestination is easily viewed falsely and usually in a way that leads to uncertainty and doubt and even despair, which is not the point of the gospel at all. And so Jesus gives us this parable to teach us how to approach our predestination. For Jesus wants us to think about it in the way that he outlines in this parable. And when we do, then we find ourselves on surer footing, and we can even find joy in his predestination of the saints. How does this parable teach us this? Well, the king is God the Father. The wedding for his son is the incarnation of God the Son. God the Son unites with a human nature in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He lives a perfect life. He earns a perfect righteousness for all people in God's sight. He dies an innocent death for all the world's sins as our substitute, earning the perfect forgiveness and remission of all of our sins. This is the feast that God prepares for all people. And then we see the invitation going out, first to the Jews, through Moses and the prophets, God inviting them to come and believe about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, once he has arrived, through Christ's apostles, again inviting sinners to come enjoy the wedding feast of Christ himself. But when most of the Jews hear this invitation to the gospel, well... They reject it. They reject it in the apostles. They reject it in the ministry of those who follow them. They had gone into all the world to preach to both the good and the bad, those whom the world considers good and those whom the world considers bad. And they would bring those who believe into the church where they enjoy the blessings of the wedding feast. But to enjoy the blessings of the wedding, to remain in it for all eternity, the wedding garment must be worn. And the wedding garment is Christ himself, whom we put on in holy baptism and faith, whom we are clothed with his righteousness. And so we see even in the parable that those who belong outwardly to the church, visibly to the church, they're members of the church, but they have no faith in their hearts, they are present, but they are not wearing the wedding garment. So that on the last day, Christ then will have them bound, taken away, and thrown into the outer darkness of hell. 
What does this teach us then about eternal election? God has prepared Christ and all of his blessings for you to feast upon. And he calls all people in this life, both those that we think of as good and those that we think of as bad, he calls them by his gospel, and he earnestly desires that they be saved. He doesn't invite them thinking that he really doesn't want them to come. No, he wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants all people to enjoy and feast on the blessings of Christ. And by working, uh, by the working of the Holy Spirit, you have believed that invitation. You have been clothed with the wedding garment of Christ's righteousness. And so the message of the parable is, stay clothed. God promises to strengthen. He promises to increase. He promises to support to the end that good work which he has begun in each of you in holy baptism. If you adhere to God's word, pray diligently, abide in God's grace, and use the gifts which he has given. When you live as one who is baptized, one who hears God's word and takes it to heart, applying it to yourself, one who prays, one who lives in love, you can be certain then that you are most certainly among the elect. For the elect says, I am baptized, and I am by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit living in my baptism, daily repenting, daily trusting in Christ, and daily striving to live in love. This is how, as St. Peter says, we are diligent to make our call and election sure. Not sure to God, but sure to ourselves. This is how, then, we endure until the end and be saved. By wearing the wedding garment each day. Enjoying the blessings that he has given to us in the gospel. That we enjoy by faith in Christ's incarnation, by faith in his suffering and death for our sins, and his resurrection, so that he may live to justify believers. So that whenever our Lord Jesus Christ calls us from this veil of tears, he will find us wearing the wedding garment. But the parable also serves then as a warning. For not all people accept the gospel's call, just as Many of the Jews at Jesus and the Apostles' time did not accept the invitation. And in every period of history, ours is no different. There are many, if not most, who reject the invitation, who despise it, who think little of it. Others who hate it and persecute its messengers. But Jesus also warns us against hypocrisy. Against accepting the Gospel's invitation only then to enter the feast to take off the wedding garment by living lives of willful sin, by imagining that faith can coexist in the heart with a desire to sin, or by simply thinking little of God's word, by hearing it but not hearing it, by hearing it and not applying it to oneself. The one who does these things may still outwardly belong to the church. He may visibly participate, but without the wedding garment of faith in Christ, unless there is repentance and being reclo and reclothing oneself with Christ, then the answer, or the end, is the outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so our Lord would warn us by this parable against hypocrisy, so that we continue to wear the wedding garment of faith in Christ, and if perchance we have cast it off through sinning, that we return to it, that we reclothe ourselves by repentance. Approaching predestination, as Jesus teaches us to in this parable, it makes it then a comforting doctrine. For God has prepared our salvation for us and has given it to us by his grace without any works or merits or worthiness on our part. He has called us to this feast of all of the blessings of Christ through his servants. He has provided us once again, with a robe of righteousness, with his perfect righteousness, which we are to wear every day. He has given us his Holy Spirit so that we might, with renewed wills and renewed minds, continually heed the gospel's invitation and wear Christ. Ogling in eternity, it won't bring you any comfort. 
In fact, it only leads so many away from Scripture, and with that to uncertainty, to doubt, and to despair, which isn't the purpose of the gospel. Only in approaching predestination here, as Jesus teaches us to, continually wearing the wedding garment, then can we rejoice. And we rejoice that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That he has predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good pleasure and his will. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds by faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise and sing the offertory on page 22.